Good morning, church. Let's stand and worship the King of Kings. <clears throat> Creation cries, oh, 
5 3 says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You guys can take a seat for the beginning of this song as we learn it. If you curse me, then I will bless you. If you hurt me, I will forgive. And if you hate me, then I will love you. I choose the Jesus way. And if you help me,
and give us clean hands give us pure hearts let us not lift our souls to another give us clean hands give us pure planning on speaking here, but I think it's important if we look at these words, we cast down our idols, and the idols in the Bible are often referred to as, as other gods, but we have idols in our life. We have real idols in our life, things that are distracting us from putting God on the throne in our life, and this, these words are important. We cast them down. Maybe it's our phones. Maybe we're spending too much time on our phones, and they were, they're with us everywhere. Or maybe it's even our families. What's your idol in your life? And are you willing to say, yes, God, I give it to you? Let's sing that again. We bow our hearts. We're bowing them before God. We're putting him on the throne. We bow our hearts. We bend our knees. Oh, Spirit, come make us humble. raise you and put you on the throne where you deserve God. We want to give you all the glory. Lord, help us to see. Help us to see the idols in our life. Help us to see where we're not putting you on the throne, God. And God, give us the courage and the boldness to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Welcome to Northridge today. Thank you for coming, and I uh, just encourage you to greet the people next to you. Welcome them here today. Good morning. Lots of greetings here this morning. Good morning, church. My name is Ann Judd. For those of you I haven't met before, my family's been at Northridge for, I think, almost two years already. It feels like we're new, but I guess we're not new. So here I am to greet you this morning. 
Um, it's my pleasure to do so. Um, I wanted to share a couple stories from the week. I hope you all had a good week. A couple things popped up for me this week. Um, I was looking at some experiences of people in our life, and there's a kid who's close to our family, and he had uh, made a choice to move schools and to play a new sport. And um, that was kind of sad because he was going to be leaving um, Ben's school. And he changed his mind. He decided he didn't, he didn't want to do that. And I don't know about for you, but I'm someone who loves to plan. Are there, are there any planners out here? Yeah. Um, I'm married to someone who's a lot more spontaneous, so there's been some balance in my life, <laughs> thankfully. And my kids are also a little more spontaneous than I tend to be. But um, this kid had made a plan, and he had made a commitment, and many of it, those are good things. We honor those things, right? And as we were talking this through, I was thinking, wow, he must have really felt strongly that he needed to change his mind. And as I was talking it through with, my, with Benjamin, I was like, you know, it, sometimes you do have to change your mind, and, and that can be difficult. And then it came up with an adult, because we're into posting season in the schools where teachers are looking at moving, moving jobs, moving schools. And someone I know was thinking about returning to my school, and I was encouraging her to do that. But she said, well, I don't want to look like I'm flip-flopping. I wouldn't want to look like I just changed my mind. And I said, but you're allowed to change your mind. Like, you can do that. But we really honor a plan, and we honor commitment, we honor, and those are good things. And I was thinking in those situations, these people might say that they're trying to listen to their gut. And in the world, we would say that, that we need to listen to our, our gut and our intuition and maybe change course. But we as Christians have the benefit of hopefully being in strong relationship with the Lord and being able to hear from Him and having the Holy Spirit lead us. And I know for, for myself, I love a plan, and it's good to be committed. But, you know, if we don't make room for those things, if we don't uh, make space for that and we don't take time to hear, I think we're going to miss out sometimes. So don't know what that might mean for you where you are, but it really made me think. And I, and I think sometimes there's some bravery in, in listening and hearing what, what else there might be for us and in, in changing our mind. So something, something just to think about. Um, Okay, our ushers, I'm going to call our ushers forward to, uh, to take our offering and what a, a gift it is that we can give back uh, and worship God with our tithes and offerings. For those of us who are, are part of Northridge, this is something that we do. And if you're visiting with us, we're happy to have you here just to visit with us. I'll just pray for our offering. God, thank you for the gifts that you give us. We turn them back to you, Lord, with our tithes and offerings, and we pray that they will be a blessing. Amen. Hey, I have some announcements, too. You might have seen when you came in, there's some silent auction items out there. So there are some silent auction items, and that is opening today, and the proceeds are benefiting Kids Camp. So feel free to take a look, and you can, I think there's a sign up, right? So you can sign up there. Uh, there are also opportunities for family photos. I think this is, the, this is your last chance, probably. And so you can speak with Carissa about that if you'd like to get some family pictures done. I have seen a lot of those family photos, and they are amazing. So you, you want to take top on that if you can. Uh, next week, there's a seniors lunch. So you lucky seniors, I know. I'm a little jealous. I'm not quite there yet. But my, my son said my hair's gray, so maybe I can, it's graying, so maybe I can get in there. Um, but it's by donation, and uh, it's going to be soup and sandwich. I'm sure it will be delicious, and I hear Gord is cooking. And you can, please, if the seniors could let Gord know that you plan to attend. I'm sure he needs to have an idea of how much soup and sandwiches he's going to prepare. So that would be great. I think that's all our announcements. I think if you identify as a senior, you can go. <laughs> that's, why, that's why the gray hair thing came up. We'll see. But, well, I don't know. Um, I don't have a firm age in mind, do I? 55. Thank you. Okay. 53. <laughs> Gord, people are going to try to sneak in. I think that's what's going to happen. <laughs> You'll take anyone? Oh, boy, this is going to be a busy lunch. Okay. Well, it's time for our students to head out to Sunday school, so have a great time learning there. And it's my pleasure to introduce Pastor Rob, known to many of us, our original pastor at Northridge. Thank you. That was really good, Anne. You could have this job permanently. <laughs> how are we doing today? All good? Why don't you talk amongst yourselves and find out how the person beside you is doing, like really at the heart level, while I do some furniture arranging up here.
All right, that's enough. <laughs> I heard some of your discussions. This could go on for a while. Well, I'm glad you're doing well. Uh, I wish I could have been here last week, but I did listen online to Pastor Les, and he did a masterful job of taking you through three chapters of Exodus. And uh, he was hopeful that you would have brought your lunch. I don't think you needed it. But today, we're looking at Moses receiving the law. He was on Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights. It's covered in 14 chapters of Exodus. So I hope you did bring your lunch, your dinner, maybe breakfast for tomorrow. This might be a sleepover. Um, no, I, Pastor David said I could just focus on the Ten Commandments. And so we're going to look mainly at chapter 20, uh, verses 1 to 17. But I do want to look at a New Testament perspective of the same law from the mouth of the lawgiver Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. So we're going to draw some scriptures from the Sermon on the Mount as well. But I will give you the context of those chapters we're not covering, and you're welcome to cover them in your own homework this week and read ahead or read behind. So I missed chapter 18, which is Moses is back where he was raising sheep for his father-in-law Jethro. This is where they are in their wilderness wanderings. He's back to where he spent 40 years in the uh, desert, right at the base of Mount Sinai. And so that chapter covers Jethro and Moses learning how to delegate. And then chapter 19, God calls them closer. So they pack up Rephidim and they move closer to the base of Mount Sinai. And the reason why God wants them to move there is he wants to speak directly to the people of Israel. So they have this encounter with Moses just at the base of the mountain talking to God and God giving the Ten Commandments to the entire nation of Israel. And there is thunder and lightning and smoke everywhere. And it is truly an awesome, awe-inspiring, frightening experience. In fact, the people said, Moses, we don't want to talk to God anymore. <laughs> it's too scary. You go talk to him and tell, him what he, tell us what he says. And that's what happens for the next 11 chapters is Moses gets all of the uh, more specific regulations, rituals, uh, religious rites, things to do with their w uh, wilderness wanderings that they're going to need that are uh, particular to what they're going to face in the wilderness and then moving into the promised land and how to preserve their faith, how to set up the tabernacle, the furnishings of the tabernacle, the priestly roles, all of that is covered in those chapters. So we're not going to take time to read through that if that's okay. Most people, when they think of the Ten Commandments, they think, it, think of them in that context of rules and regulations and rituals. We put it all in the, the blanket covering of religion. Religion is not very popular for good reason. Because God never called us to religion. He called us to relationship. And the Ten Commandments are all about relationship with our God. So that's what we're going to focus on today. In fact, I'm calling it the law of love, and we'll look at that in a minute. But first, I want to talk about the acceptance of the Ten Commandments in our world today. We were founded on Judeo-Christian values. Our nation, our constitution, our civil law is based on the Ten Commandments. And systematically, we have been seeing people rewriting our history and, and uh, recreating new values for us. Secularism has come in. And we have not freedom uh, of religion, which was intended to keep religion strong and thriving and, and protected. We have freedom from religion. And so every vestige of our faith, our founding faith, is being removed. So we see the Ten Commandments being removed from public schools, universities, government buildings, courtrooms. Here's an example from Oklahoma of them removing the Ten Commandments, by the way, late at night so they wouldn't get noticed <laughs> in what they're doing. But it's been noticed. So that's the, the world's view of the Ten Commandments. I love teaching this. I've taught it my whole life as a youth pastor, almost three decades teaching Bible college students, and I've taught it here. In fact, the notes that you're going to see are the, the last, one of the last sermons I, 
I preached here when we were doing our wilderness wandering from uh, Thomas Haney over to the promised land here at Colleen Findlay, I thought it'd be a good time to remind us of the law of God. So I'm going to use some of the notes from that. But today I thought about it. If we put that up on the signboard, where are we? Is the signboard over there? Northridge presents the Ten Commandments this Sunday. We might get rocks thrown at the sign. <laughs> People don't like commandments. They don't even like it if you say recommendations or, or suggestions, which some Christians think that's what the Ten Commandments are. We live in a day that's similar to the period of Israel's history, we call it the Book of Judges, when there's these cycles of sin. And the, the cycle always starts with everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And we have that today. Absolute truth is gone. We live in a day of relative truth. You get to choose your truth. And if it works for you, let's celebrate it. Let's welcome it. Let's endorse it. Everybody's truth is okay. And so everything that reinforces our personal truth is welcome. Guess what? Christianity doesn't play well with others. It's a very narrow way. We believe in one God. We believe in, I'm looking for a Bible. Does anybody have a Bible? Thank you. This, I have to have this at Buchanan. The, the, the seniors can't relate to a phone Bible. <laughs> this is God's word. This is the standard of truth. And we measure everything against that. Thank you, Megan, for bringing your Bible. So Christianity is really become um, viewed as hatred because we don't celebrate other people's truth. I love the song that Carissa presented today. How did Jesus stay so loved by sinners? How did he minister to people who are so steeped in sin and stay their friend, be welcomed by them. We're going to learn that today. We're going to learn how to live the law, but to love mercy. In fact, I'm going to show you my theme verse here. First of all, we're calling it the law of love. And uh, the words of Jesus are, this is my commandment. Love each other. So this is the commandment. This is a summary of the commandments of loving God and loving each other. This is one of my favorite theme verses. It's from Micah 6, 8. And look at how well it fits, applies to our living the Ten Commandments. Oh, people, the Lord has told you what is good. How many want to be good? Anybody? How many want that said about you when you die? That Rob was a good man. Jan was a good woman. Well, and by the way, I, I always taught my students this. If you want people to say good things about you at your funeral, write your eulogy now. <laughs> no, I mean it. And let that be your mission statement for your life. So write your eulogy while you're living and live it out. And you'll have the right thing said about you. But if you want to know what is good, well, here it is. And this is what he, God, requires of you. First of all, to do what is right. And we're going to find out what is right by the Ten Commandments. And then to love mercy. And this is how we're going to figure out how to get along with people in our world. And understand that sin is sin. And how to love mercy. To show compassion. To truly love them in their sin like Jesus did. And then finally, the only way we can do either of those first two things is the third thing. To walk humbly with our God. He has to be our God. And we have to walk alongside him. And do what he tells us to do. To feel those promptings. To know his word and to do everything the way Jesus would do it. And then we'll figure out how to live in this sin-sick world. All right. I have so many notes today that I felt God saying, this is Anne, I, where's Anne? 
I'm, I'm a planner. Yeah. This is really hard for me, but God says you have got too much stuff here. <laughs> I want you to stop looking at your notes and wing it. Yes. How would you do if that happened? Uh, we'll find out. I will look on occasion. One of the reasons people don't like the Ten Commandments is because eight of the ten are thou shalt not. So we're going to find out what to do, how to do the, what is right. So I'll get you ready for a movie in just a minute. But if you look at the Ten Commandments, eight of the ten are thou shalt not. It sounds very negative, very unloving. But parents, you know that it is loving to say thou shalt not <laughs> to your kids. I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but I want to tell you, I was going to show this clip from YouTube. Have you ever seen the Bob Newhart sketch where he's a counselor and he has people come in for advice and counsel and he always has two words, stop it. <laughs> Have you heard that? Have you seen that? Google it after the service, not while the service is going on, but afterwards. It is hilarious and it is my counseling technique, just so you know. But instead, I'll tell you a story of my uh, parenting skills. And I was going to talk about Carissa because I thought that'd be fun, but her or her kids won't hear. But um, I was going to mention that the time she was being helpful as a little girl and uh, washed her brother's hair in the toilet. <laughs> but I won't tell you about that because that's really embarrassing. So instead, I'll talk about her brother who had his share of exploits. And one time I was watching them, and I say that kind of metaphorically, because I don't really watch the kids very well. And uh, this was a case of that where I didn't know where Greg was. I was upstairs. I thought he was, but couldn't find him, went downstairs. I found him. And everything was fine. He was sitting and happy and smiling and laughing. The only problem was he was sitting on the stove. And three of the four elements were red hot, glowing. And he was sitting on the fourth. Now, this could have been a wonderful parent-child moment where I talk about his ingenuity of climbing up on the counter and getting over the stove and turning on the other three elements and all of that. But what did I do, parents? <laughs> stove, hot, great, and grab him and pull him off. Stop it. Don't do that. It's love to protect our children from harm. And that's what the father is doing. Stop doing that. Don't do that. It's not safe. So let's, with that context, go into the Ten Commandments here. This is a movie, by the way. I want to just briefly talk about the effect of these two movies. Do you remember who produced and directed these two movies, Ten Commandments? Cecil B. DeMille. Both of them. The first one was in, this is where I need my notes. 1923, it was a silent film. I won't ask if anybody watched that movie. But uh, it came right after the First World War, and then coincidentally, the second one that he released was 1956. And this was a full color epic, big budget film. And you know that in those two films, they, they really brought about a cultural revolution in our two countries, probably all around the world. Both followed two world wars, first and second. Both came at the time when there was a threat of communism engulfing our nations. The first Red Scare was in 1919 to 1920. The second Red Scare was McCarthyism. Do you remember that era when they're looking for uh, communists among them, among their leaders? And so this is a reaction to these threats. And this is the prologue in that silent film, the first one, that the movie starts with. I'm going to read it to you. Our modern world defined God as a religious complex and laughed at the Ten Commandments as old-fashioned. Then through the laughter came the shattering thunder of the world war. And now a blood-drenched, bitter world, no longer laughing, cries for a way out. There is but one way out. It existed before it was engraven upon tablets of stone. It will exist when the stone has crumbled. 
The Ten Commandments are not rules to obey as a personal favor to God. They are the fundamental principles without which man can, mankind cannot live together. They are not laws. They are the law. Isn't that powerful? So good. Those two movies collectively brought about, as I said, a political cultural revolution. Thousands of copies, statues, of the Ten Commandments were brought back into the public schools, the universities, the, the courtrooms, the government buildings. Those are the ones that are being removed in these last couple decades. It was a revival of faith, knowing that in times of crisis, we need a solid foundation. And now we're in that stage where we're dismantling that foundation. All right, before we get into the seriousness of God's word, let's do a little levity. Oh, let's look in here. You got it? Okay. I think I lost my battery because the, the light just went out. So I have extra batteries, but did you see that one on Facebook? Technically, Moses was the first person with a tablet downloading data from the cloud. I like that. Let's see if this works here. And if not, I'll get somebody to change my battery. There we go. Oh, that's too far. All right, so I've got two tablets up there. I've organized them in two sides so that you can see connections in the two categories. By the way, it was two tablets that God engraved both sides. So this is the outline of the Ten Commandments in brief form. Let's look at them briefly. See if you can see any connection of the first four. Do not worship any other gods. Do not make any idols. Do not misuse God's name. Keep the Sabbath holy. So who is involved in these first four? Who are we talking about? God. This is how we respond to God. And look at the next six. Honor your father and mother. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not lie. Do not covet. Who are we talking about here? Us. So this is really about our relationship with God and our relationship with one another. This is what Jesus said. Oops. There we go. Oh, did I go too far again? It, it has a delay, I guess. I, use, I like things that are fast. All right, let's read this together. This is what Jesus says in answer to a question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. By the way, that comes from the Old Testament, so I stuck in the reference there, Deuteronomy 6, 5. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Also from the Old Testament, Leviticus 19.18. Then he says these profound words. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So when we think of these onerous negative laws, remember that they're all about love. So let's look at them with those titles above them. Love God and love man. Now we're going to look at how Jesus, who is the lawgiver, remember that. Jesus is throughout the Old Testament. He is God. He's present. He shows up actually in person many times in the Old Testament. But he is God. So he is the lawgiver. So when he begins to teach about the law in the Sermon on the Mount, he knows. He represents the the spirit behind the law, not just the letter of the law. So look at what he says about what the law really means to us. Some people think, oh, Jesus is going to soft pedal. It's not that strict as it, it sounds. This is what Jesus says. And this is, by the way, right after what Carissa said. That was the Beatitudes, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Then he begins to uh, preface his sharing on the law with this. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. 
For I tell you that unless your righteousness, it's talking to us too, our righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. This is what Jesus is saying. These are serious words, and the law is serious business. So we want to look at the law from two perspectives. And there happen to be two mountaintop perspectives. If you ever want to have a, um, a good perspective, go up on a mountain. And uh, Mount Sinai is also Mount Horeb. This, the names are interchangeable in the Bible. They have meanings. I looked them up. Mount Horeb means glowing or heat. Mount Sinai means bush. Do you know where Moses encountered the call of God <laughs> to go to Pharaoh and how God spoke to Moses? Does anybody remember? Burning bush. It was right there at the base of Mount Sinai. He's back where he started, and he's brought the people of Israel back to his God, back to this place of this power encounter with the creator of the universe. So they'll have the same fear of God that he has. So this is about a power encounter, seeing God as an awesome God, all-powerful, all knowledge. This is our God. We should fear God. We should be in awe and respect of God. We should obey him. So that's the one mountaintop. The next, this is where Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount. It's actually Mount Aramis, is what it's called. And Aramis means a lonely, deserted place. And that's where Jesus went to talk to his father, to find out what he should do next. He could only do it early in the morning or late at night when nobody else was around. Instead of sleeping, he'd go to this cave, and they found the cave in Mount Aramis where they think Jesus met with his father. Uh, by the way, I was trying to figure out what to talk about today, yesterday. So I looked for my Aramis. I looked for my lonely, deserted place. So I went to the park, Mount Hammond Park. Have you ever been there? It's usually nobody's ever there. So I found a table. I sat down. I began to think about what I was going to say today. And two ladies, older ladies, about my age, showed up and began to smoke pot right across from me. <laughs> I was, I was trying to get some fresh air. <laughs> so Chris had just texted me saying, the house is empty, you can come home. <laughs> and I said, thank goodness, because I'm getting high on this secondhand smoke. <laughs> and then she texted back, well, that's one way to hear from God. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I look for those lonely, deserted places when I can get close to God, because I'm never alone. I find when people aren't around, I discover who's with me. And God is always with us. And, and he meets us in those quiet moments. And, and so Jesus is now inviting all of his followers back to the place where he encounters the Father. And it's more intimate. It's more personal. It's more approachable. It's a very special place to him. And so he begins to share about the other side of the law. When Jan and I were in Israel about 15 years ago, they built this church there. They call it the Church of the Beatitudes. It's a Catholic church. It's eight-sided. It's an octagonal building for the eight Beatitudes that Carissa read earlier. And so it's a beautiful building. We want it to go inside. But uh, the other picture there is of a nun. That's a picture I took. It's a little lady who is the bouncer for the, the place. And you can't go in if you're not dressed appropriately. And we weren't. So we didn't get to go inside. <laughs> And I thought, isn't that ironic? Isn't that like the church? To put barriers up in this m moment, in this place that should be so approachable, so relational. So it's a, it's a good warning for us to not be like that. Anyway, this is the place where Jesus delivered the Sermon on the Mount. All right, so we're going to look at those two mountain top perspectives as we go through each of the laws. How are we doing for time? This will be faster than you think it will be, I hope. I need a drink. 
You can take a drink too. Okay, here we go. All right, first law. First one is a lot like, oh, what did I do? I need my glasses. This is really hard. I did the cataract surgery, but I did it for distance, so I can't read. And Jan thinks I was an idiot for doing it, but she can't play tennis, so. <laughs> I prefer tennis. Here we go. If you have monovision playing tennis, you never hit the ball right. Have you noticed that? Anybody's tried that? Anyway, the first and the second commands are very similar. The first says, you shall have no other gods before me. This is all NIV, I think, if you look at the, uh, the version. So he's talking about anything that he's made, that God has made. And we often do that, at least in that day they did. They took the things that God had made, the stars, and they began to chart their life according to the stars. We call it astrology. Or the sun, God of the sun, or God of the moon, or the earthly elements. They would make gods of created things. We don't do that so much today, but the words that Jesus speaks about this in the New Testament, in the Sermon on the Mount, says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. In other words, God has to come first, is what Chris was saying earlier. God has to come first. We bow down to him. He is our king. And we live in his kingdom. Yes, we're citizens of Canada. But above that, beyond that, we are citizens of heaven. And so we live for our God. I like this passage in Romans, so I've included that because this really gets to the heart of our culture today. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator. So if you listen to the ideologies of our day, you'll see and hear these things all the time, that God is within everything. The universe will manifest in my life. <laughs> I, always, I, I laugh at that because the universe is just a thing. Find the person who created the universe and uh, be in a relationship with him. But the universe will manifest and God is within me and, and I am my own God. There's divinity in me. And we use all these props. And really, it's all the old pagan religion that was back to Mount Babel and the, the early Chaldeans and the Babylonians. But we have uh, Eastern mysticism wrapped up in this New Age package. And Christians are buying into it. We have yoga, we have meditation, we have crystals and, and singing bowls and gong therapy. And it's a gong show of eclectic ideas and thoughts that are idolatry. So once in a while, I'll say, get off the stove. Get off the stove. You'll get burned if you follow these ideas. All right, so that's the first one, putting God first. The second deals with the things that we make. And we're created in the image of God. We carry that creative ability that God has. And so in that day, they made their own gods and, um, or things to worship. So you shall not make for yourself an image, a graven image in the form of anything. You shall not bow down to them. Now, we don't make a lot of gods with our hands here, but what do we make that we worship? Money, money, and the things that money can buy. And Jesus called that mammon in the New Testament, in the Sermon on the Mount. No one can serve two masters. You cannot serve both God and money. And we really do worship this world and material things. I'll just tell you a personal story that I, in my midlife crisis, bought a motorcycle. I love my motorcycle. I really do. But I'm on blood thinners now. And uh, my doctor advised me not to ride my bike because he doesn't want me bleeding out on the side of the highway if I fall down. So, I thank you for not laughing. I thought that would be funny, but you really care about me. I appreciate that. <laughs> 
So um, I thought, okay, I'll sell my motorcycle, but I still need to kind of feed that midlife crisis, so I'll buy a Ferrari. <laughs> so I asked Zach how much that cost, and I realized I'd have to sell my house first. And I could live in a Ferrari. I don't know if Jan could put up with that. I know the rest of the household probably wouldn't fit. But anyway, um, I thought, where did that come from? Like, why did I have that thought? And I realized I love Magnum, P.I. <laughs> I want to live in Hawaii and drive a Ferrari. Where does that come from? The things we watch, the things we take in, we get caught up in materialism, the things of this world. And all of a sudden, God is not on the throne anymore. I'm not going to buy a sports car. I'm telling you right now. All right? Everybody's a witness now, <laughs> even online. All right, let's keep moving here. We've got to move faster. Still dealing with our love for God, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Jesus explained this has to do with vows, and he says it's good that we make vows, but our vows should be yes or no, and make sure you're a person of your word, because this has more to do with the power of our words. If you remember, God spoke everything into existence. Everything you see here was spoken by God. That's the power of words. The Bible says death and life are in the power of words, power of our tongue. And we being created in the image of God have that power to advance the kingdom of light or the advan advance the kingdom of darkness with our words. So be careful how you represent God, not just in your vows, but in every word you speak. So this is a very profound command, and it has much more to do than just swearing. And then I, from the M Sermon on the Mount, I said, again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. So when I make a vow not to buy a sports car, I have to fulfill that. I'm almost, re almost regretting it. Like, what if I get a really good deal on Marketplace or something? <laughs> I don't know if you can buy a Ferrari on Marketplace. All right, fourth command. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, this is something that we struggle with. <laughs> they struggle with it in, in that day, in, in um, the day of Moses and all the way through to Jesus. And Jesus struggled with this. They totally missed it. This was designed for us. Jesus said the Sabbath was made for us. And it's to help us to stay healthy, to maintain mental health. We get so busy at work. We work so hard. And we're supposed to take a day off of work, the work that we do to make a living. But the Pharisees, the other religious leaders, built hundreds of laws around this. When, when we were in Israel, in Jerusalem, we got on the elevator on Shabbat, which is from Friday to Saturday, Friday night to Saturday. And um, you stop on every floor in the hotels. The elevators are programmed that way, so you don't lift a finger to push the floor. You have to go to every floor. So that's how life is like under the, the Jewish law. So instead of relieving stress, it becomes even more stressful. Can I do this on the Shabbat? And Jesus would be accused by the religious rulers of picking grain or healing somebody on the Sabbath. And he says, you guys have got it all wrong. You missed the point. It's to help you. And we have lost our Sabbath. For us, it's been Sunday. And the reason that happened is when Christ was raised from the dead on the first day of the week, the Christians wanted to honor the Lord's day. So they began to meet on the first day. That's when they'd bring their tithes into the the storehouse, that's when they would gather for the breaking of bread. And so it became Sunday, the first day of the week, to honor the Lord's Day. And we had that tradition. Do you remember Sundays when everything was shut down? When people went to church? <laughs> We've lost so much. Sunday is one of the busiest days, especially for kids. So many sports, so many things to do. And they miss church because of sports. Now, Sabbath can be any day. 
depending on your schedules, because we understand that double incomes, you, you work when you can. But you need a day, not just for your own mental health. And by the way, we, we try to get our kids involved in lots of activities to keep them out of trouble, but the problem is we're burning them out. They're so busy and so stressed that they resort to drugs and get addicted to video games and all these things just to cope with life. They need time to be with the family, to be outdoors, to be at church together, playing and praying together with their family. That's one of the reasons for the Sabbath. The other is it's to be holy. We need a time to devote to God. We say, this is your day, Lord. This is a day for me to, reju to rejuvenate my spirit, to remember that you're my source for every day of the week. It's that constant reminder that God is our source and that we walk with him every day. He helps us live right, and we need him. So keep it holy. Find a way to, to honor the Sabbath day. All right, those are the commands that deal with loving God, how to love God. Let's move to loving one another. And, of course, it starts with those closest to us. Fifth command. All right, parents, are you ready? Honor your father and your mother. This is the one command with promise, or it could be considered a threat. Honor your father or your mother so that you might live long. My mother used to say, I brought you into this world, and I can take you out. There's always that hanging over your head that said, no, she was like God to me. <laughs> but um, it really does pay. Not all of us grew up with godly parents. I had incredible parents that taught me well. But even parents who struggle, who made a lot of mistakes, they learned a lot through their experiences. If you want to save yourself from being knocked around, learn from somebody who's graduated from the school of hard knocks. <laughs> Listen to their advice. And I know most parents, even ungodly parents, would do anything for their children. They would sacrifice for us. So love, honor, respect, listen to your parents. Proverbs says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Listen to your father's instruction. Do not forsake your mother's teaching. All right, let's look at this one. This one we could go through quickly. You shall not murder. Not many of us have murdered people. We think our country values the sanctity of human life. Well, we did. That's also one of the foundation stones that's being removed with 100,000 abortions every year, 10,000 assisted suicides last year. And it's going to grow by leaps and bounds now that anybody with mental health issues can receive this free service. Where is the value of human life? We're not heading in a good direction. But it's much more than just physical life. Jesus expanded on this. I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. So Jesus takes it to a heart level. What motivates murder is anger. It's offense. And by the way, we're going to do communion together very soon. And the Bible says if you have offense with anyone in this room or in the church, stop what you're doing and make it right. Because how is the body going to come together if there's anger, unresolved conflict? This is very serious. We need to keep our relationships with one another right. That's what Jesus is saying. Number seven, you shall not commit adultery. That sounds pretty straightforward, too. By the way, within that command, uh, that there's addressed a number of our key cornerstones in our foundation of gender, sexual orientation, marriage, 
the church is struggling because we hold to those traditional values and we're being excluded from grants and other things because we're not buying into the new values. This is going to be a point of contention for us and we have to learn how to navigate through this. But again, Jesus took this to way past the physical, to our mental, emotional, heart level. He said on the Sermon on the Mount, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in her heart. So our thoughts, our intentions are also important. I love this passage in Malachi. Guard your heart. Remain loyal to the wife of your youth. That applies both ways. For I hate divorce, says the Lord. If you really want to learn how to follow God, learn what he hates. And don't do that. Stop it. Get off the stove. I think that's enough said. Let's go quickly through the last three. You should not steal. Well, that's obvious. You just got to care about others. In fact, the Bible says, esteem others better than yourself. And of course, the Bible, the New Testament takes it further to, we are not here to, to steal or exploit one another. We're here to give. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they might have something to share with those in need. Again, going to the extreme of the heart level, not just what we do with our hands. Ninth command. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. I have a lot to say about this. I'll try to keep it short. Let's look at the Psalms first of all. Psalm 15. Lord, you may dwell in, who may dwell in your sacred tent, the one whose walk is blameless, who does what is righteous, who speaks the truth from their heart, whose tongue utters no slander, who does no wrong to a neighbor and casts no slur on others. Facebook is a bit of a cesspool, isn't it? Sometimes you see such accusations and such angry, hurtful words. And our kids are growing up with this and, and might think it's normal if we don't help them understand it's not. It's another thing that God hates. If you look at Proverbs 6, 16 to 19, the things, six things, and he, he makes it seven by the end, uh, end of it. Of those things, look at these. Pride, lies, false accusations, stirring up conflict. Does that sound like some of our social media and how quickly we jump on one side of a story proverbs 18 13 says spouting off before listening to the facts is both shameful and foolish so don't get involved in slandering accusing other people other christian other christian groups we see a lot of that a lot of infighting between christian groups calling each other false prophets Division in the church. It's not of God. Get off the stove. Is that number 10? Yeah, there it is. And you shall not covet. Boy, if we could learn how to just be happy with what God has given us. To be content with what we have. Why do we care much about things? Do you know that the gold that we're seeking here on earth is pavement in heaven? Get some perspective. Don't hang on to things in this world. Don't look at the things of this world. Ignore those TV commercials. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love, the love of the Father is not in them. The world and its desires will pass away. But whoever does the will of God lives forever. All right, so that's doing what is right. It's a tall order, but we can do it with God's help. Just quickly, I want to touch on this. How much time have I got? Oh, my goodness. This is incredible. Um, boy, I can see why God told me not to look at my notes. This is so good. All right, how much time you got? Have I got five minutes? Are you okay? 
Okay, here we go. So this is us. This is what we're responsible for, is our own lives, to live right. But we are not responsible to correct everybody else around us. <laughs> We've got to get that through our heads. And boy, I am prone to this. I am the worst. I judge everybody. I judge every driver on the road. I, drive the pe I judge the people in line. Uh, sitting around me, I, I, I assess people. I think I'm like a spy, and I try to figure out everybody's deal and, and how quickly we label and dismiss people from our lives. And that's not the way we're to live. We are to love mercy. In that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know why Jesus was a friend of sinners? He didn't judge. He said he didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He was welcomed to parties. He was welcomed into sinners' homes because he loved them, genuinely loved them. He didn't condone their sin. He didn't tell them they're doing a good job. He loved them in spite of their sin because he knows that sinners sin. We can expect that. So let's look at it quickly, and I'm, I don't know how I'm going to do this, but let's try it. Uh, here's what he said. Remember this? We're looking for the speck in one another's eye, but we've got a log in our own. We're hypocrites. Okay, here's the message. I love this. It was the Pharisees who would accuse Jesus all the time. <laughs> and he was the, Jesus was only hard on one group of people, and that was the religious leaders, because they were so full of pride, and he had to humble them. I love this moment when he's holding up the dime. He's been asked, should good Jews actually pay our taxes? Because they didn't want to support the Roman Empire. It's corrupt like our world is today. I don't want to pay taxes with, the, with what they're doing with my tax money. And what did Jesus say? Whose image is on the coin? Render to Caesar what is Caesar. He paid his taxes. It's good advice for us. But then let's look at the religious rulers and how they responded to the law, how they lived their life. I'll do this really quickly, I promise. Here's the groups. Here we go, quickly. The Herodians, they were Herod's supporters. They liked the Roman government. They compromised their values. They were like the Herod followers. They believed in hedonism. There's no life after this life. Let's eat, drink, and be merry. Tomorrow we die. So that was the Herodian group. The Sadducees were tolerators of Herod. They're very political. They compromised their doctrine. They didn't believe in the resurrection at all. So they were partial hedonists, secularists. That's the old joke of uh, why did they, why are they called Sadducee? They're Sadducee because they didn't believe in the resurrection. That's why they were sad. You see, did you get? I'm sorry. I, th I thought you knew that joke. Pharisees, these are the religious, the pious, the proud, the judgmental, the hypocritical. They viewed Jesus as a lawbreaker. He's the lawgiver, and they didn't get it. The Essenes were a group that went and became a commune. They preserved the scriptures in the Qumran by the Dead Sea. That's where we found the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Essenes kept those scriptures. So they're very devoted, but they're disconnected from the world. They wanted to protect themselves from the sin of the world. And the zealots were the angry, violent, intolerant people who wanted to change their situation, their political situation. They wanted to take up arms against the Romans and fight their way out. Now look at those groups and see how it relates to us. Which one are you? I would say I'm very similar to the Pharisee, judgmental, holier than thou. I look down on people. Sometimes I'd like to be isolated like the Essenes. I even at times think I could be a zealot. I think I'd like to take up placards and join the guys who are standing at the entrance to Maple Ridge. I don't know what they're protesting, but I'd find something. <laughs> think about that. Which one are you? And now let's consider Jesus. The Jesus way. Do what's right. Love mercy. And the only way we're going to be able to do either of those things 
is to walk humbly with our God every day. How did Jesus live? If you want to take some time this week, just go to the next chapter after the Sermon on the Mount and look at what Jesus did. First of all, people followed him. Large crowds followed Jesus. He didn't chase them away. He wasn't an isolationist. He went with the people because he loved people. His heart was moved with compassion upon them. And he touched them, even the lepers who had to ring a bell and declare, unclean, unclean, don't touch us. Jesus touched them and healed them. He loved his enemies. Look at the centurion, the Roman officer uh, in charge of 100 soldiers. These were the enemy. They're the ones that were oppressing the Jews. And he went and commended him. Look for bridges with people in the world, even your enemies. See think things in common that you can celebrate and connect with them about. And he, he praised his faith because he believed that Jesus just had to speak his word and his slave would be healed. Jesus didn't ask him, why do you have slaves? He didn't judge him. He healed his slave. He was all about God's kingdom. He didn't care about the home, uh, being homeless. And we had people who were following him saying, I, I want to come and be with you forever. And he says, well, foxes have holes. Birds have nests. I don't have a place to lay my head. Where are you going to sleep? He didn't care about those things. His home was heaven. He was just on assignment. He was on a mission to bring God's kingdom to earth. Then right after that, he calms the storm. He brings peace wherever he is. And then he goes over to the most hated region in that place, in that time. The Decapolis. Those were the, the ten Roman cities that were steeped in perversion. Jan and I were there, and they have an inscription to the brothels uh, saying that there are these the best-looking children, boys and girls here, that were here for your service. They're prostituting children. Jews stayed away from the Decapolis, but Jesus didn't. And he went there and he delivered them from demons and he healed them and sent them back to their towns to proclaim the gospel. Let's bring the worship team up. Well, I tell you about this movie. Did anybody see the Jesus Revolution? This gave me great hope. I'm old enough to have lived through this. I was a youth pastor at the time this was happening. And it was similar to today. Young people were dropping out of society because it was corrupt and there was wars and there was a lot of greed and materialism. They're dropping out of the church because it was irrelevant. It was exclusive. And they were looking for peace and love. And they're disillusioned with all of these trappings that they'd left, but they found out there was no peace and love as they looked inside. And so they turned to drugs and went into bondage, and they're struggling, suffering from venereal disease and all kinds of complications of their lifestyle. And then they began to find Jesus. And they wanted to go to church but they didn't look like the people we let in our church doors back then. <laughs> we dressed in suits and looked good, and, and uh, this scene from the movie really touched me. When uh, Kelsey Grammer, who plays Chuck Smith, said, okay, the, the board members were complaining about their dirty feet coming into their new shag carpets. Remember shag carpets? And so the next Sunday, he was there washing their feet as they came in. I want to tell you what happened at convention, Foursquare Convention, just a couple weeks ago. We met with a group of people who are looking at deconstructionism, which is uh, young people falling away from the faith. So it's happening again today. And we were trying to figure out how do we reach them? How do we show them that God loves them? And at our table discussion, Terry Jansen, he, he said I could share this, told about his own son and his own struggles. And his son Brody um, did not want to follow the church, got disillusioned with church life. 
He got involved in drugs and heroin addiction, homeless, wound up in prison. And the very first time Pastor Terry went to see his son in prison, it was just such a shock to him. He didn't know how to react, and he felt God speak so clearly to him. I want you to love him as he is. Not as you hope he will be one day. Love him right now the way he is. And as he began to share this, he teared up and so did every, everybody, everybody else in that table. And then he shared it with the whole room and they all felt that Jesus way. As we sing this song, this is how we're to communicate the truth that we're learning today. To love people just as they are. People that Jesus died for while they were yet sinners. And if we can learn to communicate that love, we won't be seen as haters anymore. So we're going to take communion together. Our ushers can get ready. And maybe just during the first part of this song, Adam, can we just pass up both elements, the, um, the bread and the cup? If you can hold it on your knees, maybe stay seated during this part. And uh, as soon as we've got both elements, I'll come back and we'll do communion together. Thank you for your patience. I'm sorry I went so long. I don't get to preach very often, so I had to cram a lot into there. Let's worship the Lord. If you curse me, then I will bless you. If you hurt me, I will forgive. And if you hate me, then I will love you. I choose the Jesus way. everybody have the elements? Not yet. Okay, we'll give you a few moments. Let's take the bread first. Continue to pass it out while I talk about the bread. So Jesus took the bread when he was with his disciples, this last supper before he went to the cross. And he held it up and he broke it. And the breaking of the bread was symbolic of his body being physically broken. That's what he went through on the cross. But his body was broken because he was thinking of this day and all the other moments when his body comes together and we become whole. We are the body of Christ. We are members of the body of Christ. When we remember <laughs> the body, we come together. We remember. And we fulfill what Jesus went to the cross to do. We bring his body together. So as we think about that, think about the church, that's why it's important for us to have right relationship with one another. If there's anyone in the church that you've struggled with, that you have offense with, please resolve that. Make it right. Live right. We need to be one. So let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the way you let your body be broken for us, knowing that someday your body would be whole. Your church, your glorious church, without spot or wrinkle, would come together in the holiness and the perfection of God because of what you did on the cross. And we take eat right now in remembrance of what you did. Amen.
and then his blood was shed. He held up the cup and he said, this is my blood. This is the new covenant. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. That's why there is this system of sacrifices that the Jews carried on until it was fulfilled in the perfect sacrifice, the spotless lamb of God. His blood was shed once and for all that our sins could be forgiven. And we could be filled and dwelt by the very Spirit of God so that we could truly walk humbly with our God like Adam and Eve did before sin ever had entered into the picture. And it was all done through the blood of Jesus. It also reminds us of what we need to do when we pick up our crosses daily and follow. It calls for sacrifice. It's a life of sacrifice here on this side until we get to heaven. So let's remember that. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the sacrifice. Your blood was spilt for us. And now we are fully saved. We are holy, pure, not by our own works, but by the completed work of Jesus on the cross, who knew no sin and yet died for our sins. And now we receive this as a reminder that we are saved and holy. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's receive. Let's continue to sing about Jesus' way. And if you strike me, I will embrace you. And if you take me, I'll sing his praise. And if you kill me, my heart will gather. Lord, this day we determine to choose your way. Every moment of the day, we're going to walk humbly with our God. We're going to choose to do what is right. And for those around us, Lord, we're going to love them. We're going to love them with God's mercy and grace. And Lord, I pray that that grace and mercy would flow out of us from you. And we would impact our world one person at a time. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I didn't finish the story with Brody. He's clean. <laughs> He's back in church. He's serving God. But it began with that sense that his father loved him no matter what. 
Our Father loves you no matter what. And he loves everybody you come in contact with this week. And so my benediction is that verse I declared over you to begin with. Oh, people, the Lord has told you what is good. And this is what he requires of you. Do what's right. Love mercy. And walk humbly with your God this week. See you next week. Lord bless you.